Hi everyone, Sam Levick, owner and founder of Fun Fitness for Littlies Australia, here to present another episode of Kids Love Sport. Today, I'm joined by a Paralympian who is gunning to become only the seventh para-athlete to represent Australia at both the summer and winter Paralympic Games, swapping the track for the slopes. Growing up with cerebral palsy on the central coast of New South Wales, before the NDIS was introduced, she first competed as a para-athlete at age 13. Please help me in welcoming Ray Anderson to the Kids Love Sport podcast. So today I'm joined by Paralympian who is gunning to become the seventh para-athlete to represent Australia at both the summer and winter Paralympic Games, swapping the track for the slopes. Growing up with cerebral palsy on the central coast of New South Wales, before the NDIS was introduced, she first competed as a para-athlete at age 13. I'd like us all to welcome Ray Anderson to the Kids Love Sport podcast. Welcome, Ray. Hey, thank you for having me. No worries at all. You're in a, you're in a funny looking spot there. <laughs> where, are you, where are you joining me from? So I am on the Central Coast in Hardy's Bay on my little, I call her my little Mimpy. So she's my little sailing boat. Um, and Mimpy means dream. So I've always dreamed yeah, right. of little yep. boats to live on. So I'm out here enjoying the sunshine while I can. Uh, Mimpy Inda, beautiful dream. For <laughs> those that are listening, uh, that's Bahasa Indonesia for, yeah, beautiful dream. Mimpy Inda. Uh, yeah. Funnily enough, Ray, I spent four years in Jakarta and Ray did some studying recently. But we'll get into that a bit later on, Ray, about your time over in Indonesia. Uh, but firstly, where did your sporting love thrive from? Well, honestly, I would say it, it started on the water. I mean, I'm here now. I yeah. guess it's appropriate to be on the water talking to you for this podcast. But yeah. Uh, my family, growing up on the Central Coast, everything was very much water-focused. If we weren't out in the boat during summer, we were on the slope skiing. So uh, I was always encouraged to try every sport and to get out and get active and, and enjoy the sun while it was out. Um, so we did do a lot of sailing, a lot of boating, a lot of fishing, a lot of surfing. Um, so really it was just all about getting out and enjoying being active and being outside and I guess even the social side of it, hanging out with my family and friends and meeting new people out on the water. Yeah. So uh, growing up with cerebral palsy, it obviously hasn't stopped you. <laughs> it hasn't, and your family hasn't taken it as, hey, she can't do anything. It's, let's do it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yes and no. With cerebral palsy and growing up with it, I didn't know any different. Um, it was my normal. I mm -hmm. always used to say, like, as a kid that I thought it was normal to be in and out of hospital every six months having surgeries and, and different treatments. I had a lot of Botox so I could move my muscles uh, in my arm and my leg. So I thought that was just part of being a kid and growing up and um, I just found ways to adapt around it. So I guess being my normal, being out on the water, having cerebral palsy, that was just my every day. Um, at the same time, it, it sometimes did stop me. I didn't start doing proper, I guess you'd call uh, team sports or organised sports until I was a bit older. So it wasn't until I was in year three or four that I actually started competing in team sports just because of the, the risks associated with it and also because I was in and out of hospital so much. It was a bit hard to commit time to teams. So a lot of my sports were very much out on the water or just playing uh, socially with my friends mm. in the street that I lived on. Yeah, it's a, it's very. Um, like my cousin has cerebral palsy, and and I've grown up around that. Um, and it's interesting that yeah, you're on the boat, and and you grew up around sailing. Because my cousin, as part of his, I guess outings in Taree on the north coast of New South Wales, a lot of it was sailing. He was sailing or temping bowling. That was sort of the two things that I guess was okay for people with a disability to do up there. Um, mm. There wasn't that much support. Was it? How, how was it on the Central Coast? Obviously, being closer to Sydney and in between Newcastle and Sydney, were there more opportunities, services available for you and the family? From 
I guess a sporting side of things, no. We we didn't know that there was avenues for me to go into mm. um, para sport even. Yeah. Um, so it was just a matter of finding those networks to, I guess, build my physical abilities to then be able to participate in Ablewood sport and whatever sports were available to me on the Central Coast. We did have mm. to travel a lot to Sydney to have treatment at Westmead Children's Hospital. Uh, mm. So I did do a lot of rehab and a lot of physiotherapy. But there wasn't such a big push from the Children's Hospital or any organisations to get involved in any, I guess, organised activities like sailing or like you were yep. saying. Um, being on the Central Coast, I am a lot closer to Sydney than, than you are up in Tamworth. But we, we're still quite isolated on the Central Coast. It's still, I mean, you can drive there. It's an hour and a half, but I guess you still feel quite limited because that is that drive to Sydney and having cerebral palsy. Yeah. It's the impact of having that travel and then having your body react to that travel and then having to have that treatment and then come home again and having the reaction mm. to the whole time. So mm. I, I'm seeing a lot more organised activities and encouragement for people with disabilities and I guess even kids to become more active in organised sport than what I had as a kid. I was just lucky that I had such a active family that didn't see any reason for me not to try everything from such mm. a young age, which was very lucky. Yeah, so active family. So mum and dad obviously promoted being outdoors, getting involved in physical activity. Brothers and sisters, you, you've got a couple or...? Yeah, so I've got a younger brother. Um, yep. He was all into all the sports. He played AFL, um, a, what do you call it, rugby league uh, and yep. surfing. So, uh, yeah, I was always on the sideline watching him being like, when is it my turn? Because obviously yeah. he was younger and he was already doing um, organised yeah. sports. Just getting the opportunity to get out and muck around with him as well was fun. Yeah. So at age 13, you did get the opportunity to participate as a para-athlete. So was that through... The school system or was that through um, Athletics New South Wales? That was such a chance um, meeting. So I went okay. our year six um, excursion to the AIS, yep. uh, the Australian Institute of Sport in Canberra. Uh, just the typical, I guess, camp. I think most year six kids get to go to yep. the Canberra. <laughs> I did that too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and our tour guide was Evan O'Hanlon. So he's the 100, 200 and 400 metre world record holder for the cerebral palsy classification. Yeah. So we met him and obviously my co my teachers knew that I had cerebral palsy. Um, again, didn't realise that it was such a difference for me. I, I'd always just thought of myself as equal with my peers and I might have just had a weaker left side. Um, yeah. Obviously, I didn't realise that it was such a, a, a common disability. Mm. Um, and Evan took me under his wing and encouraged me to join and train for athletics. Yep. And I started training with him, with his coach at in Canberra when I was 13, so the following year um, once I started. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it was a bit of a whirlwind from there as a 13-year-old, <laughs> working in all yeah. that, what events that I want to do. Mm. So, what, so did that mean you had to relocate to Canberra or was it just holidays, weekends? So I guess we there wasn't that many adaptive programs as a, as a kid when I was growing up yeah. as a 13-year-old. Um, there was a program that Australian Paralympic Committee, now Paralympics Australia, organised um, with Athletics Australia. Oh, with Athletics Australia. So there was two programs um, sure. that eventually became Athletics Australia when I was about 16, I believe. Um, so every six months they would take us to the AIS. Um, they'd fly us all there for, it was considered the development program camps. So oh. all the best athletes across Australia were flown to Canberra for about three or four days to train with the best coaches that um, were a part of Athletics Australia at the time. Yeah, so so it's a re it really is a, such a chance opportunity that, that you like you said it was a, a Canberra excursion, Evan O'Hanlon, and then and then you're into it. I'm into it. <laughs> so many children around Australia that with cerebral palsy or any uh, additional needs, um, if they don't, unfortunately, yours is a, an amazing <laughs> little story there. But 
if if you hadn't have had that chance meeting, what would it look like today for you? I I always say to other kids that I had I had two goals, maybe even three, yeah. year five and yeah. year six, and I, I think goal setting for me uh, did start at a young age. Uh, un, unmeaningly, it just yeah. kind of happened where I I wanted to become my school sports captain. And I wanted yep. to come for Australia and I wanted to study overseas, um, study another language. And I didn't really realise mm-hmm. what competing for Australia really looked like as an 11, yep. 12 year old. Did um, you get the sports I, captain bit? I got the sports captain bit. Oh, good. Yep. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, so, yeah, I always thought that I'd be competing in, in soccer with the able board teams. And I guess that was probably a bit of an ambitious goal as an 11-year-old with cerebral palsy competing against able bods. Um, Mm. Yeah, and then it all just kind of fell into place and I found out that there was a path for people with cerebral palsy and other disabilities to compete at a Paralympic level. Yeah, Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, Yeah, I love that goal setting. Yeah, we, we do it. Some people do it consciously, some people do it subconsciously. Um, but I love your I love your three sports captain represent Australia learn another language. <laughs> That's a, a, they're three quite specific ones. Mm. So when you went into like with Evan and you, you mentioned that you had to choose and there were so many opportunities then from Evan and the coaching staff and the AIS. How did you narrow it down to being discus and javelin? <laughs> what, what was <laughs> well two I guess. They weren't too happy about it. They really wanted me to be a sprinter on the CP relay team. Well, from um, what I'm hearing, it sounded like, yeah, you, you, were, you were a runner. Yeah. <laughs> Turned into a thrower. No. Well, yes, I was very much training to become a relay runner. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just I fell in love with the idea of throwing and I, I loved the throwing community. Um, and I loved, I guess, with my CP, it's um, – it's very much affected by the weather and um, any sort of fast movements um, is very hard for me to keep up that sort of momentum. So for me, especially at that younger age, doing discus and javelin, I had six attempts to do my best, whereas with 100 metres, that was it. I had just had to run that 100 metres and I guess that adrenaline even um, affects my CP, makes me cramp a lot more. Mm. So being able to relax and have time to control my thoughts and um, get into the right mindset to then do it again and try to better my uh, distance for my second and third and next throws. So I don't know. It felt a lot more natural. I enjoyed it more. Um, Running is a lot of training too. But (laughs) (laughs) no, it was definitely the whole experience is really rewarding and I'm glad that I was given the opportunity to choose what event that I wanted to do. Yeah. So where did did that take you, discus and javelin? competed on the world stage yeah so at um oh i will admit at a 16 15 16 17 age group i still was a multi so i still did still compete in all the events i did prefer the field events because i did have those extra i guess opportunities to better myself each event so i did still do long jump um so i competed at the commonwealth games in glasgow in 2014 as a 17 year old in long jump uh, before oh. transitioning to discus and javelin for the world championships in 2015 and then Rio and then the world championships in uh, London in 2017. Ah, so you, did, you didn't actually start with discus and javelin. Well, you, you did it, but you didn't compete in it. That wasn't your first world stage competition event. So it really could have been. I really could have uh, competed at in discus and javelin at the Commonwealth Games. Mm. Although the Commonwealth Games, um, they only cater to a certain amount of para events uh, for each yeah. games. So my events for that games in 2014 uh, weren't included. So I had the option oh. to try and qualify for long jump. Given that I was still training for long jump, I still competed at a school level in long jump. Um, so it was my opportunity to make a team to have the experience to then go on to the World Championships and uh, Rio Paralympics the following year. Yeah. Did you just say at a school level you were still competing in the long jump? So you were competing in the able-bodied long jump through the high school system? Is that- no. So no? We're, 
really lucky that the school system does include para events. Um, in saying that, the programs are still quite limited. I'd, I'd love to see more inclusion of para events. Um, I was mm. presenting medals at the All Schools New South Wales event yesterday. And oh, nice. Which was awesome. It was so great to see so many para athletes, especially CP athletes. Um, yep. But unfortunately, well, fortunately, I guess it's still very much fortunate that they are able to compete at a school level. But I think they only had six events all up. I think they had 100, 200, shot foot, discus, 400 and 800. So they didn't have the full oh, wow. full array of events. I think they might have even had long jump. So yeah. I'd love to see the opportunity there for them at a national level to be able to compete in more events and then equally at a nas- international level uh, at a Commonwealth Games to be able to compete in their chosen event. Mm. It's so interesting that even at the elite level, there's still a limited amount of events, which is the same as so all schools, um, for those listening, is is where the the first place getter in each state essentially is invited to the all schools competition, which was held at the Sydney Olympic Park over, oh, it's still running today, I do believe. They're in the, the fourth day um, today. Yeah, and I've been keeping a little close eye on that across Instagram and, and Athletics New South Wales are very good at, at getting it, the word out. Um, but even at that level where it really is the elite of, of Australian junior athletes um, before, I, I'm not sure if the Pan Pacific Games are still running um, for athletics, uh, but it's really our showcase for athletics. So for for the people with a disability, there's still only six or seven events there. And then you go to something like a Com Games and there's still six or seven. It's no different, yeah. which I, I find that quite intriguing (laughs) yeah i mean i guess it's a new sport and you know our first paralympic games were held after world war ii so really if we think about it it long ago um and then we've got to find ways to include it in the timetable and the scheduling so Mm. for in all schools if we included every single para event and equally if we included every single paralympic event at a commonwealth games you know, the schedule could go for a couple of weeks extra yeah. than what it does. So, yeah, I, but I guess the scheduling, I can see the difficulty in, difficulty in it too, but it'd be so nice to be able to see that the next generation of athletes had that opportunity to go, this is my event and I'm going to be able to compete in it at the next mm. Games rather than having to do the switch like I did to make sure that I had that international experience. Yeah, that's right. So you... You switched uh, back to long jump if that, that sounds funny, but <laughs> you really sort of were wanting, and, and I loved how you used the word love so much when you talked about discus and javelin, which I, I find with, with working with zero to 12-year-olds, it's, it's all about the like. <laughs> it's, it's, the passion of love for an activity or a sport isn't there as much as it used to be. Mm. Um So, yeah, it was very refreshing to hear the love that you had for those events. So after the Com Games 2014, was it? Yeah, 2014 it would have been. Um, So then you got to compete in discus and javelin on the world stage after that. Yes, 2015. So my last year of high school, I was currently doing my HSC. I think the the World Championships were during the last week of the HSC exams. So I had to do all my exams in four days and then I still had two exams to go. I flew out to Doha, completed one exam before my the day that I competed and then an exam at 6 a.m. the morning of my uh, javelin and then I was called by my coach back in Australia saying that I have to go back to sleep and have a rest during the day. (laughs) I competed at eight thirty that night after finishing my last HSC exam. Wow, what a, what a that's <laughs> not many not many sixteen, seventeen, eighteen year olds doing their HSC as as they've just done. I mean, this year is a very different one, so it was quite a odd period for those doing their HSC this year. But when you were doing it, that's that's next level stuff. Um. So how did that mentally 
because the sport is not just about the physical side. So mentally, that would have been an, emo- an enormous, not just week and, and day there in Doha, but even that lead up, you would have been training hard. You would have been studying hard. How did you, you obviously had a great balance there. How did that all work? Yeah, I think I was very lucky with my personal coach and, again, my family network has just meant Mm. that I can achieve and do so much. Um, But it was definitely all about balance and having sport as an outlet during school, throughout my my whole schooling, through um, high school especially, it was an opportunity to focus on more than just – studying it was it was another out another outlet I should say so for me during the HSC I had that exam I had to study for that exam but then I had something to take me away from that study I had to train for the for the world championship so I do very much appreciate the experiences that I've had in school and during sport as a balancing I guess act where they've really supported each other and even to get into university my sport um, has offered me so many scholarships I was offered two scholarships before I'd even finished my HSE before I'd even started my HSE so going to the world championships knowing that I already had a position at university to study what I wanted to study took that extra pressure off Um, but equally having sport gave me that opportunity to have those scholarships and to do so well in school as another mm. outlet. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> well done. Uh, with So growing up, you did all these different activities, fishing, boating, skiing. Um, even when you became, you know, a para, an elite para-athlete at such a young age, mm. were you still doing those family outings? Were you still involved in skiing, fishing, mm running around or or just doing whatever you were prior to that point? Um, I was for a certain amount of time. Leading into Commonwealth Games, my coach for the Commonwealth Games said that I need to focus on long jump and only on long jump because of the risks associated with doing other sports. And I, looking back on it, I, I, I wouldn't say I regret it because my coach knew what was best for me and by me, yeah. but if I had advice for other athletes, you need those other outlets, especially as an elite athlete. Like you need to be able to go, this is my sport, I love it, but I also need another outlet. So in the lead up to Com Games, I did drop um, all my other sports. And it was stressful because you know I had school as a balancing act for athletics, but after I left school, I did have university, but that felt like it was mostly complementing my athletics. Um, so after Rio, I did get back into some of my other sports as another outlet and because I love them and I really miss them. So, Mm. um, yeah, that was, that was great to be able to get back into it. Now as an athlete, I'm I'm focusing on alpine skiing, um, but I still go down to the track and throw a discus and I play wheelchair basketball for the social side because I love it. And yeah, just getting to meet new people. Um, and yeah, just all the other opportunities that come with sport, focusing on sport and what it can give you is awesome, but also being able to have that variety and, and meeting other people that are associated mm. with those other sports too, I think is, is very important for a mental side of things as well, not just socially. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there as far as <laughs> why I'm doing this podcast. Um, <laughs> because, you know, from my upbringing and my personal circumstances Mm -hmm. uh, going through the elite pathways with hockey with New South Wales Um, I've I've played with you know multiple kookaburras that have gone on to play for Australia in the Australian hockey team at multiple Olympics but they gave up a lot similar to what you've just said they gave up a lot to focus on that whether they were you know good at other sports as well and and I've always found that cricket and hockey go hand in hand or any of those hand-eye softball baseball yeah. golf uh, because your hand-eye coordination you're going to be able to do different things and it's all all about brain training 
So yep. you might be having a bit of time off off hockey and playing golf, but you're still hitting a ball. You're still swinging your arms. You've still got body movement patterns that need to be there. So it's it's understanding your body. Um, and then the mental side. You mentioned how the mental side is, is such a big thing. If you've got an, another outlet physically, that can actually focus you better on on your chosen or, or the love of your, of your sport. It's, you dropped in alpine skiing there, like <laughs> so. You've gone from you've started play, uh, like uh, being an elite para athlete. You've com games, long jump, world champs, and uh, and Olympics discus javelin. And then, what's this about alpine skiing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so alpine skiing, I guess, was one of my first loves of sport. It was kind of my introductory sport alongside you know your swimming when you start. Yep. Um, I guess learning how to swim, as all Australians tend but, to. Yeah, well, I was going to say, uh, most Australians learn how to swim, but <laughs> 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 swimming and skiing, oh, I didn't get to go to the snow till no, I was that's 20, true. I think. <laughs> yeah. That's true. No, so, but, but yes, no, that was, I guess, one of my other introductions to sport with my family. Um, we'd go on uh, yearly trips when we could. And I, I fell in love with the sport and I'd watch all the other kids who were c- competing in the this racer kid club where they get to do slalom and GS. Yeah. And I'd always just watch them and I'd be like really wanting to join in on it. But being, I guess, a Central Coast athlete living seven hours away from the snow, it was just never plausible to be competing in a winter sport. So mm. during Milo Kids, which is I think our version of, I think they call them Ruse, in Perisher, just what do they call them now? I can't remember. But we used to call, be called Milo Kids and we'd race through uh, witches' cones while they were yeah. racing through racer gates. Uh, so after Con Games, I was given the option to transfer to uh, alpine skiing, which obviously was a bit of a love for me. I love skiing. Uh, but I, I committed I committed to Rio Paralympics and I, and I wanted to make it to Rio Paralympics and see what I could achieve there. So after we were at Paralympics, I really wanted to go to World Championships and win a medal or at least be there and experience it with my coach because she'd come over to um, coach me. And that meant a lot to me to have her there, to have her have that experience with me. And after yeah. London, the opportunity to compete in alpine skiing came up again and they've actually offered me two scholarships. They're like, please, <laughs> can you give this a go? Um, had, had you gone to a trials or something or was it literally somebody had seen a video of you going down the slopes at Parisier and going hey this girl's got it yeah well it was I I had so much confidence in myself <laughs> in my abilities that I was on a family trip after I'd competed at the Commonwealth Games and I bumped into the para alpine skiing coach who had big Australia written across the <laughs> jacket and coat. And I've gone up to him and I'm like, hey, I can ski. And he's like, yeah, all right. Cool story. <laughs> no, but like you can understand, I have cerebral palsy. <laughs> and he was stoked. So ever since then, we've kept in close contact. And he's like, you know, like whenever you want to make the switch to alpine skiing from athletics, I'm here. You have the opportunity. Um, and he finally talked me into it after World Championships. Uh, in London because I I didn't have those events like I said earlier at the Commonwealth Games the following year um, at, on the Gold Coast, which yeah. being a home games, yeah. was a, a little bit painful to know that I wouldn't be competing. So mm. I made the decision to to switch to alpine skiing. That uh, just what you said there about going up to him like, how old were you then? Was... I I just competed at Com Games, so I was seventeen. 17, okay. Well, you know, but still to have the confidence to go up to an Australian coach, doesn't matter what event, what code or anything, to go up to an elite coach of one of our national teams and go, hey, I can do this sport too. <laughs> um, but but yeah. it, it really demonstrates that you, from from our conversation now, I'm going, you have never hidden behind your disability. You've always thought of yourself as having ability, mm. which which is just I don't hear enough of that, unfortunately, and and I think we don't have enough of that positivity 
Um, there's so much negativity around disability, even though people like me who run programs for children with a disability try to go, no, you guys are able. Yeah. We, we do it in a slightly modified way, but you are able. So uh, hats off to you for that, <laughs> just <laughs> confidence and courageous to go go get what you want. Um, so those listeners out there, if you if you know somebody with with a disability, you know, give them those supporting ways to give them this confidence. Uh, Ray's just that example from Ray's just you know, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> um, but yeah, so elite elite track, and then you've gone to elite. Um, alpine skiing so where where's that at at the moment how's that been for the last couple of years because that was 2018 was the last com games which so what three or four years ago now yeah but that offer came through and you've taken it on yeah the offer came um and i am still tossing up with it which it was perfect timing um i decided that that year i was just going to take a break um, I was kind of a bit overwhelmed at the fact that I wasn't going to be competing at a home games. Mm. So that was when I took the opportunity to go and take my study abroad um, for six months in Indonesia yeah. to finish my major, which is great. It gave me time to assess where I stood on, on elite sport um, and I guess life in general, like personally. And I did decide to come back and give alpine skiing a go. I was, I've been given this opportunity and I'm not going to let it pass. So the following year, I met a coach um, who wasn't part of the para program at all. Uh, the biggest thing for me was that I was given this scholarship, but once that scholarship ran out, there was no way for me to fund my skiing journey. So I thought that was going to be the end oh, of it. Right. Yeah. Come 2018, uh, 2019. So I met this coach and he, he was working as a manager at a ski resort down in, in Jindabyne. So having that opportunity to be coached by this amazing coach who had no power experience and to be given a job and a accommodation to pursue my dreams um, of becoming a, a dual Paralympian, that's when I decided that that was, I mean, all these things just aligned for me. So that was when I realised that this is something that I can do. All these things have come together, like everything happens for a reason. Mm. So that year I went over to America and started training for seven weeks in America and then I was in China. I was meant to be training in China for four weeks, but unfortunately COVID hit, so I was mm, brought home. Yeah. So we did get to train a bit this year in Jindabyne and where we were planning on going to Europe um, to obviously qualify for the Paralympics in two years' time. But at the moment it's all uh, dry land training is what we call it when we're yep. in the gym <laughs> or running on the track. So just at the moment staying fit and, and ready for whenever competition can start again. Um, and I guess mentally staying prepared for that as well. I know a lot of athletes are struggling with it at the moment, but mm. we're all in it together. So, so I think I'm quite excited for what the future looks like. Yeah, well, it seems like there's there's lots on the <laughs> lots coming. But I just want to go back to your your six months that you had there. Was that was that a conscious choice of oh, I, I need to step away from elite sport? Was it a like to re-energize, or did you just go, "Hey, I just I've got this opportunity." That was goal three, wasn't it? Yeah. When back when you're in year five or six, that you wanted to learn another language, and from personal experience, going to Indonesia is probably the easiest language on earth to learn from English because it's got the same alphabet. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Indonesian was always. One of the languages I wanted to learn, um, my parents knew a little bit, albeit you're counting to 10 and your yeah. general sort of greetings. So I learned them at quite a young age and, and decided that if I was going to learn another language, that one that I already had a background in would make sense. Yeah. Uh, so I started studying Indonesian at university and I had to take a study abroad for my degree as part of my major because I was majoring yeah. in Indonesian and Asian studies. So it was just finding that opportunity to do my exchange and have it fit in my athletics career as well without interrupting it. So when I found out that I had no events at Commonwealth Games, it seemed appropriate to get away and have a mental break from sport but also do this other thing that had always been a goal for me since I was 11 or 12. So the timing was appropriate um, and whilst it was 
just because I couldn't compete at the Commonwealth Games and I didn't think I was going to have the financial means to pursue skiing. And then what does athlete, athletics and elite sport mean to me and what am I with, without being an elite athlete? And that whole mental mindset of um, if I don't have elite sport, then then who am I and what am I going to have afterwards? I think that's a part of being an athlete that a lot of elite athletes go through is that what comes after sport, like we don't really ever have that opportunity to think about afterwards. And I think there is a lot of mental health issues after sport and especially when she's been on this high of competing for Australia and then coming mm. down, and what's next? So I think going over to Indonesia was uh, a forced break because I couldn't compete internationally the following year at Commonwealth Games. But equally coming home from that, it just opened up my whole perspective on, on my sporting career, on life, about just how many opportunities are out there after sport. Um, mm which I guess made the transition to alpine skiing and out of athletics even that little bit easier knowing that there is more to life than elite sport and it's more about the experiences and getting to travel the world and meeting these new people and learning these new languages that sport has given me. So, Mm. yes, made that transition a lot easier. Yeah, hopefully kids listening have have just (laughs) heard that and gone, Okay, so I need to, like, school is still relevant in my life, even if I want to be an elite sports person. I still need to somewhat have some sort of education behind me, yeah. um, which is which is a great story because I've, I've got a few people on this podcast from, from hockey and, and those sorts of sports where, and, and athletics is, and I'm sure alpine skiing and, and, the, and that side of it are very similar in that it's not, you don't get paid to do it. And if you do get paid, it's it's nothing compared to what everyone is so used to with your crickets, tennis, golf, rugby, AFL. Um, there's only those handful of sports that you can actually make a full, full living from. The rest, it's more about the love, if yep. anything, um, and, the, and the struggles like you're, you've just alluded a couple of times to the financial struggle of going into a winter sport in Australia is... <laughs> it's monstrous and that's why we don't have as many as we probably could yeah but on that the the um i know the the winter olympic committee have have set up some pretty amazing facilities now for for uh for the dry land training now because we've got some of that in australia don't we yeah so we've got an indoor ski slope um it is a it's kind of like a treadmill i would explain it as so it's okay. basically a treadmill on an angle uh, with a pole out the front so you can do, do drills. They can drop cones in front of you so they act as the gates that we'd ordinarily train uh, ski through yep. like the slalom or GS. Yep. Um, it's not as practical, I would say, uh, to be mimicking what would ordinarily be the conditions when we're racing. So we have got that there as a, a plan D, which – during COVID, we might use occasionally, but we've also okay. got some great gym uh, setups in Jindabyne, and we'll probably yeah. be doing a lot more in the gym whilst we're in Australia. Uh, in saying that, we have got New Zealand; uh, they've got an indoor ski slope, which is uh, ah. made in basically a big freezer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we might be able to use come January, January, February next year. Yeah, wow, that's that's a that's a different kind of struggle, isn't it, from the athletics pathways where, yeah, unless you win a gold medal and you get a couple of dollars from the government, <laughs> there's not really that much financial support. So no. having having a disability, you know, a lot of people since 2016 have been been loving the NDIS. You started your career prior to the NDIS. How yep. has it changed now since the NDIS has come in? How has that changed for for you as an athlete and you as a person? NDIS has, yeah, changed the way that I've, I guess, been able to live my life. I think I've had a lot of worries about the future and the, the what ifs with my cerebral palsy and what if I stop sport, um, knowing that if I stop sport, my body's going to deteriorate. Um, the biggest reason for me to be in sport is the physical benefits that it Mm. gives me with cerebral palsy so having that support there and being able to 
use NDIS to stay in sport and to find those connections to get into sport to even start with. Um, it's I'm I'm so glad that it's been introduced and even beyond just me as an athlete. Uh, a lot of the work that I've done beyond sport through other organisations to support other people with cerebral palsy and other neurological mm. issues. Watching them come through our programs through NDIS has been amazing. We had one uh, adult, a, a man who had never done sport before and was still living at home, and he came through us and said, NDIS has given me funding. Can you help me to find a sport? And mm. we took him to a tennis come and try day two weekends ago, and he's hooked. He loves it <laughs> so much that he's planning to go back every week and just to know that that support that NDIS has had across Australia, not only on our kids but on adults as well with uh, different yeah. disabilities, it was so great to just watch him thrive and enjoy it so much. And I've never done it before and just been so good at it even. It was yeah. Amazing. Is there, a, have you got a, a tip or anything for if we've got listeners that have, have got an NDIS plan or looking at an NDIS plan? Have you got any tips on on for them to get support for sport? Because I know a lot of there's a lot of there's a bit of a grey area around that one. Yeah, um, it's not necessarily advertised, but there is ways and means. And my coaching with Fiona Singh, the para badminton player, is funded via the NDIS. Yeah, um, very fortunately for her that that she's able to do that as a with with me. Um, but I know there's a lot of people out there that, yeah, they don't realise that sport can be put in there because, like you've said, if you don't be physically active, you're going to deteriorate physically. And that's a, like muscle tone um, and your muscles are just going to deteriorate quite yeah. rapidly. Um, and, and by being physically active, you're keeping your body as as lean as possible as far as movement and, and everything's working how it should be but the moment you stop you're more susceptible to that going downhill quicker than if say I was to stop yeah. playing sport yeah and I guess sport whilst it is this this great opportunity to get fit it's also I guess even more so for people with disabilities but equally for everyone it's it's increasing your quality of life mm. um, and I think that's why NDIS is so important it's about in, improving people's quality of life and I know that it is hard to find parasport if it wasn't for the fact that Evan found me at the AIS when I was 12 going into high school, that I wouldn't have known about the opportunities to get into sport at this sort of mm. level. So there are opportunities out there and there are organisations out there that are, are willing to help you and um, give you these pathways to different sports and find a sport that's appropriate for you. I know with so many different disabilities that one sport might be great for one person but it might not work for another. Um, That's right. So, you know, if, if you're in a, a wheelchair, if you're a wheelchair athlete, um, there's so many great organisations like Wheelchair Sports New South Wales. Yep. Um, if you've got neurological conditions like cerebral palsy or uh, ABIs, brain tumours, um, yep. there's organisations like CPSAR, so Cerebral Palsy Sporting and Recreation Association, uh, yep. New South Wales. Um, and those organisations, if they can't help you, there's that they have connections with other sports organisations that can help you find other sports mm. organisations. And there's just this whole world out there. And once you find it, there's so there's someone, there's one organisation or one person who's willing to help you find what you're after, what you mm. need personally. That's right. Before we came on, we, we had a, a little chat and Murray Elborn came up from yeah. um, Sport New South Wales and he's the um, director of inclusion. I do believe that's his yep. title, um, and he's what a what a person he is for um, um, going for forward into the the sporting domain and going. Look, we've got disabilities, but we get a chance too. Let's make as many opportunities. Such an advocate, um, and having a disability himself, he's a great role model for everyone. Um, and you've obviously had some sort of time with Murray. Yeah, I Murray is amazing. I met him, I think, when I was 14 at an Australian Paralympic Committee camp in Narrabeen. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, that, I'm really glad I met him. We've 
we've worked on a lot of projects together. Um, we worked on the Sport New South Wales Active Abilities Series, um, yep. which is another great online resource for with, for kids with different disabilities. Um, okay. I helped the cerebral palsy one, but there's definitely other. I think we did some on vision impairment and other um, intellectual disabilities as well. So, yeah, he is a great connection and he's doing so much for the disabled world and uh, sporting world especially. Um, and it's very exciting to, to see what he has coming up and what he's planned, mm. what's, what's coming up next for the next generation of people with disabilities. Yeah, that's it. It's it's very much so. Uh, I'd say it's moving pretty um, fluidly at the moment as far as support for inclusion uh, with disability uh, sports especially. Uh, but one thing I do want to quickly ask before we wrap up is, um, so when it comes to mainstream sport, I find there's a lot of trouble getting a child with a disability into a mainstream sporting organisation when there's nothing for them, uh, especially in, in like Temwa a regional town and, and then you've got all those remote towns around Australia. How, what would you, do you have a couple of bits of advice for coaches or or parents on how to support a, a child with cerebral palsy, for example, to be included? Is there? Yeah. I mean, every everyone's different. Every kid with dis- cerebral palsy is going to present differently to the next. And, mm. I I only ever competed in able-bod sport, and equally, when I went into athletics um, as a para athlete, my coaches were able-bod coaches. They I was their first para athlete, so for us, it was really learning together and finding ways to adapt the program to be suitable for me. Um, given that I had that left side weakness, finding ways to maybe do things. Uh, that predominantly use my right hand or just adapted yep. the programs to suit me. It's doable. It really is. Like I went into these coaching groups who were all able bods and it's just a matter of working together, like the athlete, the coach, the parent, the support network. Now that we've got NDIS, there's so many different adaptions and programs that NDIS can support for people to get into able bod specific sports as well. Mm. Yeah, no, that's adapt. That's uh, that's probably the biggest. That's that's the word <laughs> that sums it up. Really, adapt and and being an able-bodied coach myself, um, taking on Fiona, I've I've found myself taking a lot of little aspects of different sports that I I coach and bringing them into her, and she's going, oh, this is this is fascinating, <laughs> and and it's just adapting different scenarios. And, yep. and not just living in that little box or that's that's what the manual says, this mm. is how I have to do it. Um, I think we need to uh, get a bit more of a full picture and to get that adaptation for everyone to be involved. So like, that's a great, great point. Yeah, you saying like within the manual, when it comes to para sport and disability, there is no manual. <laughs> Yeah, coming up with it on your on your own on, on the spot and, and working with your coaches. So, yeah, there is yeah. one way that it's going to work for one athlete. That's right. And and from able body sport where, you know, that's the scenario. You have must bounce the ball. You must do this, that <laughs> and the other. Well, we just have to adapt it to, to make it more inclusive, isn't it? And even if that means um, so... The way that they've adapted the wheel, the wheelies, like the wheelchair sports, are just fascinating to watch as well. Um, yeah. How they've adapted a traditional rugby game <laughs> into this—it's uh, kind of like a derby on wheels. <laughs> the way they play, it. yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's what they call it, isn't it? In the, yeah. in the disability world, it's the murder ball. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's quite quite amazing, but. Yeah, that adaptation and and more support. So great points. Thanks for that, Ray. So I've been asking all the podcast guests one one question. Um, Do you like or love sport and why? It's it's a bit of a broad question, but I'm I'm posing that exact same question to everyone because I, I think like and love 
very, very fascinating. So I'll hand over to you on that. Yeah, wow. I mean, I am very particular with words and and how we use them to express how we feel about things. So this is a, a very interesting question for me. I think... Suka or Chinta? Yeah. <laughs> if we go on Bahasa, everyone. <laughs> Suka <laughs> like or Chinta love? Yeah. Um, I think... Sport has given me so much and has made my life what it is today. Like I'm out on a boat. I was meant to go sailing today. So (laughs) it very much is my life and what my life has ultimately revolved around. So without it, I don't know who I'd be. So I'd I'd definitely say it is a part of me and it's something that I I do love and it Mm. has given me all these opportunities. I'm talking to you today. So. It's very much a, a love relationship. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. I, I just love that you're sitting in on Mimpy, your, your dream boat, <laughs> <laughs> for this. It, it's so fitting that, that where you've come from as a child to now as an elite para athlete, um, you, you still you still got so much of characteristics of your childhood still to today, which, which is hats off to you and, and your family. It's amazing to see. So thanks so much, Ray, for joining me today and, and I hope everything works out over the next couple of years for with your alpine skiing. Uh, are we ever going to see you uh, don the green and gold with discus and javelin again or is that? Look, no? I'm, <laughs> I'm never writing anything out and, you know, sport has given me so much and it, it opens up so many doors and I'm never going to close any of those. So could yeah. well happen again. Fantastic. Well, hopefully we'll we'll be able to catch up face to face at some point through Murray or or one of the the Sport New South Wales Inclusion Days. Maybe I'll I'll try and get you up here to Tamworth where we've got a great great community um, of of families with children with disabilities in particular um, that I'm sure they'd love to to learn a bit more about how and and what we can do. But yeah, fantastic story. Thanks so much, Ray. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That's no problem at all. Enjoy the afternoon on the boat and we'll, we'll chat soon. Great. Thank you. Looking okay. forward to it.